My name is Daniel Cantor. I'm the president of the Florida Society of Neurology and the medical director of neurology. We do patient care, we do education, we do research. I'm also board certified in headache medicine, and a lot of you have seen me talk about multiple sclerosis and talk about headache. Today we're doing something a little different. We're going to try to review neurological emergencies in general. This is a huge field, and this is to give you a taste of what happens in your office, what happens in the emergency department, what diseases you should think about when you're seeing the patients. Another title for this is Why Stroke and Why Beyond? So let's start with my disclosures. I have no financial disclosures to give about this talk. I do have a disclosure, however, that I love fat. <laughs> stroke. Let's talk about stroke fat. Stroke is the third highest cause of death in the United States. It's the number one cause of permanent disability. The cost of stroke-related care is over $51 billion dollars yearly. As we all think about healthcare costs, we need to think about this. Why should you care? Besides the humane, humanitarian reasons, 99.9% .9 of all strokes happen outside the neurologist's office, which means we're not the ones there. In fact, in 2006, out of 633,000 physicians, only 13,500 were neurologists, 2%. And then out of them, the vascular neurologist, it ends up being 0.06%. So the states with the highest prevalence of stroke, Florida ranks there tied for number two. This is very important. It means you're going to be seen. What is a stroke? There's some confusion. A stroke is not only an ischemic stroke where there's a lack of blood. It could also mean that there's bleeding going on. When we look at the five warning signs of stroke, we can look at things that affect the central nervous system, not in terms of the spine usually, we'll get to the spine, but in terms of the brain. So weakness, numbness, dizziness, mental status changes, as well as headache. Major stroke risk factors, many of you know these, these are the same as the cardiovascular risk factors, things like hypertension, cigarette smoking, atrial fibrillation, all the sorts of things that we should be talking to our patients at each interaction we have with them. How do you manage stroke? Well, you manage stroke, remember that it's an emergency, so you think about the ABCs, you think about intravenous fluids, we sometimes do cooling where we bring down the temperature, the idea is to almost freeze the brain so metabolically it doesn't have to be too active. We do not want to have high blood glucose levels, and we bring that down, we position the patient flat, and blood pressure we actually usually leave it alone, or we do bring it down, and the MAP we allow to mean arterial pressure up to about 150. Sometimes, though, we have intracerebral hemorrhage. So there are sites of spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, and what you see here with this diagram is different areas that you can see it. You can see lobar hemorrhages, you can see the idea of pontine hemorrhages. So there's different areas where there can be bleeding, and they help us to know the reason. Common etiologies of the intracerebral or intracranial hemorrhage are going to be primary hypertension. And here we look at the typical sites, you think about 50% of these sites are going to be in the putamen. There's also a risk of recurrence in terms of the intracerebral hemorrhage, and we have to go ahead and control the blood pressure. There's something called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and these are people that have microbleeds but they can go ahead and have an actual low bar hemorrhage. And this becomes important when you hear about someone who's had a stroke, they've had multiple strokes and they kept getting worse and they had a bleed in their brain, it's probably cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And actually we all have these amyloid deposits as we get older, but sometimes this can be pathologic as well. We use a certain MRI sequence called radiant echo or grass sequence, and this can show us microbleeds that are happening all the time. Vascular malformations, as well as aneurysms. So we think about AVMs, atro, uh, atriovenous malformations, arteriovenous malformations, as well as aneurysms that we can see at different sites. And these can, of course, bleed. They lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they can lead to other types of hemorrhage in the brain. Sometimes, what are the cause of these hemorrhages? So when we think about 
coagulopathies that happen from anticoagulation, you can see these devastating bleeds that go ahead and happen. With TPA, which we've used for ischemic stroke, and now we've extended the window from three hours to 4.5 hours, traditionally we think that 6% of the time there's going to be a risk for intracerebral hemorrhage. There are certain risk factors, the older the patient is, the worse the stroke is. If you already see early signs of a stroke on CAT scan, normally you don't see signs of a stroke with the first CAT scan. And so when you do, what that's telling us is it's a bigger stroke, more likely to bleed. And of course, if you don't control that glucose level. There's other etiologies, and it's a perfect time to talk to your patients about it. One of them is cocaine. I'm reminded I was an attending at the University of Florida in Chance Jacksonville. And I was in the ICU doing rounds, and the gentleman there had positive cocaine in his urine, he had a seizure, and I talked to him about the risk of using things like cocaine, and I said, sir, you really got to stay off the crack. And he goes, I don't use crack. And I'm like, sir, we found it in your urine. <coughs> then I walked out. Then he turned to the medical student and he said, why did that guy have to be so rude? I don't use crack, I use cocaine. So I didn't think about the uh, cultural and socioeconomic uh, stigma associated with one type of cocaine versus other types of cocaine as well. When we use diagnostic imaging, CT is fast, CAT scan is fast, and it helps us with blood. That's why we do the CAT scan fast in the emergency room. It's simply to tell us, is this a bleed or not? If it's not, and you think clinically it's an ischemic stroke, time is ticking, and you go ahead and you give TPA. You can see the, the intracranial hemorrhage, you can see the intraventricular, which becomes worse, and then there's also the subarachnoid, which you're gonna see with the aneurysms. This chart, some of you may remember, when you think about T1 versus T2 imaging on MRI, how do you remember if it's hyperacute or acute? There is actually a way of remembering this, which is II, Itty, bitty, baby, doo doo. And the basic idea is II, iso intense, iso intense, B means bright, so hyper intense, and B means dark, or hypo intense, and that's how you can remember the different order of what happens in T1 and T2. Sometimes you see these on board exams. What causes death? There's early causes and late causes. One of the problems with early causes is people give up too fast. Remember that if a patient is in the ICU with a neurologic reason, they are going to survive usually and recover a lot of function. That's why we don't give up in the neuro ICU. Because what happens is they, their real complication are from the medical complications later on. So actually they looked at studies where what you see here are the two colors. So whether you don't have an early do not resuscitate or you do have an early do not resuscitate and you control for other the predictors of mortality and what you actually see is it was the DNR status that caused the mortality more than other predictors of bad outcome from intracerebral hemorrhage. This is important when you're dealing with counseling. When you see that patient, they look bad, and the families can be really distraught. But if you can survive the beginnings, you can probably survive with the amazing ICU help we have from intensive care. We've talked about different kinds of stroke symptoms. What I'm going to go through now is other sorts of things that you'll see and what the other neurologic emergencies could be causing it. So altered mental status. Altered mental status, you think about the arousal, and when you go from there, you can go from the lethargy, you can go from obtundid, stuporous, comatose. On the other hand, you have manic or hypervigilance. Somebody who is not able to concentrate, contrary to popular belief, that is not a problem I actually have, but this idea that arousal can also be a decrease, but it can also be this hypervigilance. By the way, that was your cue to laugh at a joke earlier. <laughs> so causes of altered mental status. When you think about it, it's one of the most common reasons we get called in the emergency department, and you need a way of remembering it. So this is one way, and it's move stupid. So when you think about it, metabolic, hypoxemia, vascular, electrolytes, seizures, tumor, uremia, psychiatric, infectious, as well as drugs. So all these different reasons can lead to a altered mental status, and this is where the history, a careful history, is 85% of what we do as neurologists, and then we do about 
examination, and then the other 5% are testing such as the fancy tests like MRIs. So what's our basic approach? Our step one is to really go ahead with airway, breathing, circulation, make sure we have all these things. To really think about if the glucose is low, that's the fast thing we can do, it's a fast vital sign in a way. We may want to consider naloxone if we think that what's going on is going to be opiates. In step two, we have time for that history of physical examination. Is there something standing out that might cause this? Does this person have liver failure? Do they have drug intoxication? Is there something cardiac going on? And then in step three, what we're really going to do is we're going to go back to parts of that step two and we're going to say, well, do we know a little bit more about the history? Do we maybe now have family members that can help us? We have to think sometimes about infection and about lumbar punctures. And when you suspect that the person has meningitis or encephalitis, you should already start treating them with antibiotics, get them fast, do that LP after making sure that they don't have papilledema, and in most places after having done a CT of the head, which is very fast and is actually a low cost to healthcare as opposed to the risk of causing herniation from that lumbar function. So we think about the time course. This helps us with our etiology when we think about it. In the past, I've lectured about localization, where something is versus etiology, what causes it. So time course is important. What we want to know is we want to know their baseline level of function. Was this person somebody with mental retardation who didn't have a great baseline? And what we're seeing is not a change. I saw a patient in the emergency department at Chance Jacksonville who looked like she was having a stroke. In the end, she was actually having status epilepticus that was going on. And the problem was we didn't really know her baseline. And then we want to think about the associated symptoms. Are there signs of infection? These become very important when we're thinking about the altered mental status. And then we want to think about the comorbid conditions, other things that can do. There are a lot of them. And look at this. We go back and back to social history. Social history is important, especially drug use. In our examination, you see how we've done it. And you remember from school, we do the level of alertness. We look at memory. Look at language. Remember, speech and language are different. Speech is how you articulate language how you repeat, is whether you can have spontaneous speech, whether you can understand, as well as writing. We think about calculation. We think about apraxia. You know, we ask people, pretend like you're holding the nail in your left hand and you're holding the hammer in your right hand, what do you do? And there's some people who have no idea what to do, and then, of course, hopefully the correct way is to do it that way. Ask people how they brush their teeth, and that can tell you, are they having a problem with praxis, with how they do things? We think about frontal signs. So what we see is an uncovering of the older signs when somebody was a baby and now it's coming back out. We want to think even about logic and abstraction, although personally, when you ask that question, what happens if you find an envelope on the street and it's stamped in its address, I don't know what the correct answer is because it's not clear that the person's intent was to put it in the mailbox. Perhaps they had second thoughts. So sometimes. Our, our questions don't really make sense, and you have to think about ones that make more sense and that are culturally sensitive to your patients as well. When should you consider lumbar puncture? You can see I'm a southerner now. I say lumbar instead of lumbar puncture. And further neuroimaging. Most of the time when we see these patients in emergency situations, they've already had a CT of the head by someone in the emergency department. So especially when we see signs of them being febrile, if they've had a seizure, if they've had recent head trauma, loss of consciousness, talking about all the new concussion rules is a whole other talk that I can give in the future. But we think about, maybe we should think about lumbar puncture, maybe we should think about further neuroimaging, such as MRI. We've mentioned dizziness. Dizziness is a common complaint in general. People come and say, I feel dizzy. You have to really nail down. Are they talking about dizziness, disequilibrium? Are they talking about vertigo? Are they talking about balance problems? Whenever a patient comes in and tells us a symptom, I drill down. They say, I feel numb. I say, what do you mean by numb? And they say, is it tingling? Is it less feeling? Is it no feeling? I've had people, by the word numbness, mean weakness. I've had them mean that they have a tremor, and they use the word numbness. So you really have to drill down to what's going. You have to do that separation of syncope, or do they remember what's about to happen? So they have near syncope, and they're about to go. Do they have pre-syncope? Do they have vertigo, this vertiginous feeling? 
And it can be helpful when we try to classify what they have and we think about the differential diagnosis of things like syncope. So there's a long list. Just to give you an idea, we could be talking about neurologic reasons. We could be talking about orthostatic hypotension. We could be talking about cardiac reasons. These are all different kinds of things that we can think about. Is it a structural heart problem? Is it almost like angina, like heart attacks, like MIs? Or are we talking about a cardiac rhythm sort of problem? When we're thinking about near syncope, is there a loss of consciousness or is there an alteration in consciousness? This can help us in terms of separating what the causes of this are. For vertigo, we often think about peripheral causes as opposed to central causes. We think about migraines as one of the central causes. We think about brainstem problems and brainstem strokes as one of the central causes. A lot of times, the peripheral cause is the more severe cause, but the central one is the one that's more of the emergency. And remember, what we're trying to do here is kind of give you highlights of when to think about emergencies, as opposed to what we can do later in the comfort of our office and try to think about it. So we have to think about the word dizziness. We have to think that patients have peripheral vestibular dysfunction. We have to think about the fact that there is a high incidence in the elderly of disequilibrium and central vestibular problems. Psychiatric conditions, if someone says they're always, always, always spinning, that it is not normally what we see with something like vertigo. And so that might bring it up, but always put psychiatric last. We too often in medicine go ahead and put psychiatric high up in terms of what's going on. You have to be a good physician assistant. And the way you do that, I was told by the chairman of Brigham, uh, Brigham and Women's in, uh, in, in Harvard, in Boston, he said a great neurologist is different than a good neurologist. A good neurologist makes that diagnosis fast in the blink of an eye. A great neurologist is able to change their original thought based on the findings at hand. We have to go ahead and think about how different information impacts what we think about. So when we're approaching that person with dizziness, we want to think, is this vertigo? We want to think that it's never continuous unless we're talking about psychiatric cause. But I would be careful in medicine to ever say never about anything. We think about presyncope. We think about disequilibrium. We can think about nonspecific findings. Are they having lightheadedness? Is this an orthostatic problem? Is this a cardiac problem that's going on? Infections. We've mentioned meningitis and encephalitis. So meningitis is an inflammation and infection on the meninges, the covering of the brain, as opposed to the encephalos, which is the brain itself with encephalitis. Altered mental status is going to be a big part of this, as well as headaches. But when it involves the actual brain, you're going to see any sort of involvement of the brain, which means you can have motor, sensory deficits. You could have visual problems with meningitis and encephalitis because of papilledema, because of swelling that's going on in the brain and then swelling that's going on in the optic nerves. When we think about encephalitis, we think about viral, we think about bacteria, protozoan. We think about non-infectious reasons for encephalitis. We're not right now it, yet in the West Nile virus time, last year we had an outbreak of West Nile virus in uh, Duval County and it spread a little bit, but really we had a lot of cases of neurologic involvement and we teamed up with the Department of Health in terms of that. So it's important to know what the epidemiological changes are at the time. If you're in an area that has dengue fever, you should really know the signs and symptoms of dengue fever. If you're not, you should know it anyway, but you don't necessarily have to think about it in every single patient. Viral ideologies, of course, you have Epstein-Barr. JC virus, when I'm lecture about MS, the John Cunningham virus, which is the reactivation of the slow-growing childhood virus that we are now seeing in patients in multiple sclerosis who are treated with a specific medication, natalizumab. Other infectious etiologies, you can go all the way from bacteria to fungi, you can think about protozoa. There are a lot of things that you can think about and you really tailor this to what's going on. Are they having rashes that are systemic that can help us in terms of that? What pattern recognition can we do? When we think about non-infectious causes 
of encephalitis and that they're, tr that they're mimics of this. You could have tumors. You could have a dural venous sinus thrombosis. So you have a clot that goes on in the veins that are in the brain, and this can cause venous strokes. We see that with oral contraception. We see that with pregnancy. With any time that you're going to have hypercoagulability, such as a patient with cancer. We have to think about granulomatous diseases like sarcoidosis. We think about cerebral vasculitis, Bichette's disease, which is an autoimmune vasculitis seen often in the Turkish population in Middle Eastern, but not only, we see it in the white population as well as the African American and Hispanic population as well. There are migraine syndromes, but I would be very careful as a non-headache specialist, not even just as a neurologist, to make such a diagnosis. This is just to remind you for the board exams when you look at the different types of cells that are there. So are there a lot of cells? When you see a lot of cells and you have a lot of polys, what you're going to be thinking about is septic, so bacterial. Then you can think about viral, where it's lymphocyte predominant, as well as tuberculosis. And these are, for a lot of you who have already taken the recertification exam, these are the sorts of questions that they're going to ask you. I want to focus a little bit on HSV because herpes simplex virus, if you miss it, that's a complete no-no. People without treatment, it's 100% fatal. When they gave them, uh, when they gave them, when they gave them RSC, it went to 70% and 70% survival, and then 100% survival should happen almost 100% with proper treatment with a cyclovir. So you really want to think about this in terms of it. So some uh, some estimates are between 70 and 100 percent mortality when you don't have treatment. So a cyclovir, you dose it at 10 milligrams per kilograms IV every eight hours, and then you think about the different amounts of time. Most of us are going to go ahead with 21 days. You can do a PCR in terms of HSV. You can also do the antibodies when you do that lumbar puncture. The problem with HSV is you're going to see bleeding into the temporal lobe, and this is going to be a lot of the problem you can see, and unfortunately it ends with autopsy. You never want a disease where my slide is a pathologic slide. We don't do biopsies that often. When you see something like that, that's not a biopsy, that's an autopsy. And you want to be very careful not to get to that point. Weakness. What can cause weakness? So when you think about weakness, a lot of things can cause it, right? We want to think, is there objective muscle weakness or is there non-objective muscle weakness? So when it's non-objective, and this is how we're always thinking about things, is it caused by a neuro neurologic problem? Is it caused by a non-neurologic problem? Non-neurologic problem is not synonymous with psychogenic. So if you're sick in other ways, if you have anemia, if you have other reasons for a feeling of weakness or for a generalized weakness even, or generalized fatigability, that's one thing, as opposed to objective signs of weakness. And then what we do is we think, is this localized or is this generalized? Once we think about whether it's localized, we think is it asymmetric or we're talking about a symmetric problem. When we talk about symmetric, we're going to talk about the specific patterns, we'll show them, the muscle problems versus neuropathies versus other sorts of problems that can happen from the root. We want to think, is this proximal, is this distal? So when we're checking leg muscles, if we see a proximal problem, we think more about a myopathy, muscle problem, and when we see more distal, we think more about a neuropathy. Because the nerves come out of the spinal cord, and then they come through the cauda equina, and they have to go all the way to the bottom. So if you're going to have a problem with the nerve, it's going to be more of the distal area. Unless that nerve is cut, but if you're going to have a neuropathy where you have a slow problem with your nerves, it's going to go ahead just like that stocking glove you think about with diabetes mellitus. So when we think about differential diagnosis, we try to localize. We say, okay, the weakness could start in the muscle. Then what we could have is we have a neuromuscular junction. We think about things like Lambert-Eaton or Eaton-Lambert, depending on where you trained. That's presynaptic problem with the neuromuscular junction or postsynaptic with myasthenia gravis. Then we think about the peripheral nerve. You can think about the nerve root that's going to go ahead into the spinal cord, and then you can think about the brain itself, the deep white matters all the way to the cortex. 
So what we use is the history to help us. We actually do use the exam a lot here to help us differentiate between the different causes or among the different causes of the muscle weakness, and then we have a differential diagnosis. So when we do localization, it's important to go back to your anatomy books. It's important to think about the idea that you have the lateral tracts, and those are going to cross at the pyramids and medulla. But you're also going to have those medial tracts for the trunk that actually don't cross to the other side and go down into the spinal cord. As I mentioned, we have neuropathy and neuropathy. You should have a reduction in the deep tendon reflexes. You will have sensory abnormalities like in diabetic polyneuropathy, and you're going to have more distal problems than proximal. If you have a muscle problem, on the other hand, your reflexes actually might be normal, they might be decreased just because the muscle's not working, but it's not a problem of the nerve, so you shouldn't see an effect on the reflexes. Remember, reflexes go from the central nervous system and normally we would be hyperactive, but then what we do is we have an intact central nervous system makes it normal reflexive. So when you have a problem with the central nervous system with the upper motor neuron, you're going to have hyperreflexia as opposed to neuropathy where you're going to have decreased reflexes. Because it's a muscle problem, you don't expect there to be sensory problems. When you're talking about neuromuscular junction, it's going to be a diffuse problem. You're going to see involved in also the eyes. When you think about myasthenia gravis and the fatigability, you're going to have a person looking up and you're going to see this ptosis happening. But a neuromuscular junction shouldn't really affect the reflexes, and it's a neuromuscular junction, it shouldn't really affect sensation. So when we're doing physical exam, we want to know, is this a problem of full effort? Are they actually doing the effort? Are they not? We have different ways of doing that. We sometimes ask them to raise their leg, and we put our hand under the other leg, and we see, are they pushing down? Because normally, if you're trying, you push down with the other leg, and that can be a sign that can be very helpful. We look at that generalized or localized. Is this unilateral or is this bilateral? Is it proximal or distal? Do we think this is upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron signs? Like, do we see a lot of atrophy? A lot of atrophy should be lower motor neuron. So there's a disease where you see a mixture of upper and lower motor neuron, and that's amyotrophic viral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. So localization, like I said, can go all the way from the muscle up to the posterior fossa and then supratentorial. Cortex of the brain. I mentioned myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is sometimes an emergency when a person is having a myasthenia gravis crisis. And we want to think about this bimodal peak of incidence. The highlighted in yellow is actually from board exam questions that you have. And I know we're not at the winter conference for the board exam uh, clues, but those are clues. We also think about surgical and musical of the thymus. We think of myasthenia gravis as a paraneoplastic disorder, and in that case of the young patients, that's what we want to think about removing the thymus. But sometimes a person's having a crisis, meaning that it's actually affecting not just the, the muscles that go in the eyes, the neuromuscular junction eyes, but it can also affect the ability to breathe. And that's when we're going to try to see what their vital capacity is and the negative inspiratory uh, function are going to be things that we're going to go ahead, so the negative inspiratory fraction, things that we're going to go ahead and check. A simple way, if you don't have something for them to blow out, is to follow how long they can count in one breath. So if you try it on your own, you can keep going pretty far. A person can only go to 40, and then they go to 30, and then they go to 20. You know they're getting worse, and you want to think about ventilatory support. We can do an easy test with an ice pack test. What we're seeing is a patient with ptosis, we put ice on them and the ptosis gets better. What we're doing is we're freezing in a way the neuromuscular junction. Less and less people are using the Tensilon test nowadays because of the risk of bradycardia as well as bronchospasm. And like I said, the test we also have people do is to sustain updates and look for this fatigability causing ptosis. So, if you're having this respiratory failure, you want to think about whether they have over-medication, you want to think about infection, and you want to think about the myosin itself. If you think about an infection, you think about antibiotics, respiratory support. Sometimes we go ahead with plasmapheresis, so we're cleaning out the plasma. Other times we give something, so we give intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG, also called IGIV. 
There's other causes of weakness. Guillain-Barre syndrome, so acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy is what we can see, and there's the more chronic, the more chronic type of CIDP, and that's not what you necessarily have to think about in emergency situation. You have to think about the acute setting, because what you're gonna have is this ascending weakness that's going to go ahead, you're gonna affect the diaphragm as well. You're going to go ahead and you're going to have autoimmune function is going to be the reason for it. And we think about demyelination. But when there's axonal involvement, these are the patients that grow faster and these are the patients that go ahead and have higher risk of mortality. The incidence, however, is fairly low, one in a million, and it's about the same in men and women. We go ahead and we look for a lumbar puncture, we do the EMG nerve conduction study. These are less things that are going on. In the emergency setting, we're thinking here about the ventilatory support. In Guillain-Barre syndrome, you really should have a lot more motor involvement. You can have some tingling in the feet, but really, this is about ascending muscle weakness, ascending paralysis. The person is going to have loss of reflexes or less reflexes. And then there's variants, the Miller-Fisher variant, or what you're going to have is a problem of eye movements as well. You're going to have ataxia as well as areflexia. We're thinking about other things. We mentioned the spinal cord. In the spinal cord injury exam, you want to look at the rectal tone. You do want to check the rectal tone. You want to think about, are they having incontinence? Are they having spastic bladder? Are there upper motor neuron signs? Or are there lower motor neuron signs, perhaps at the beginning? And then are there autonomic changes? Remember that the autonomic nervous system goes through the spinal cord, and a disruption of the spinal cord can go ahead and affect the autonomic nervous system. So when we're thinking about the etiology of spinal cord injury, it could be from direct trauma, there could be compression from a bone fragment, from hematoma, from infection. There can also be ischemia. So when we think about the etiology, the causes of injury, what you go ahead and you're going to have that motor vehicle accidents are going to be a significant portion of what we see. And so you're going to think about younger patients and then patients who are on motorcycles, you're going to think about them, they're bike week, these are going to be perhaps reasons. Sports should be fairly low, and then when we think about miscellaneous, we think about other things such as spinal cord infarcts that you can see. So it primarily affects young adults. Young adults are going to be in a situation where they may be drinking, they may be at risk for trauma, they may not be wearing the seatbelt, they may have other reasons. There are predisposing conditions as well, arthritis, osteoporosis. This can mean that there could be fracture of the bone, there could be compression before this. Primarily affects men more than women just because of the risk taking that men take often. So there's two important things. When you're talking about a spinal cord level, it's important to have the same communication with the trauma team, with the neurology team, with the neurosurgery and the orthopedic team. And the neurologic level is defined by the most caudal. So we have cephalic caudal is going to be lower down. So the most caudal level, you have normal sensory and motor. Not one or the other, but where is it going to be normal? That's where you're going to do it. And you're going to think about the motor and sensory impairment may be at different levels, and it may be asymmetric. So you have to go to where they're both normal. That's how you define the level. So we use this often, and you may have seen this in trauma centers, you may have seen this in the ICUs as well as in emergency departments. And you basically check off, it's a nice kind of system because it goes through elbow flexion versus elbow extension, wrist flexion versus wrist extension, the fingers, and it can help you to know. Remember that three, four, five keeps the diaphragm alive and respiratory function with a high cervical spinal cord injury can be very, very dangerous. We also use the Asia scale, and the Asia scale talks about not where the problem is, but whether it's complete, incomplete, and what type of incomplete injury there is. And these help us with predictors of understanding and using the same terminology that people are using in trauma centers and emergency departments and other places. In the spinal cord, we have multiple tracts, which means these multiple tracts can be involved in different sorts of syndromes. So when you're seeing a patient, the examination is going to be really useful because you're going to think, do they have a lot of posterior 
Uh, we have a lot of posterior sensory involvement, so we have a lot of problems with vibration. If you don't have a tuning fork, then proprioception is very useful. Do they have problems more with light touch, cold, and pit prick? Do they have problems with actual movement in the muscles? And that's going to be very helpful when thinking about where is it happening in the spinal cord. There are a bunch of different specific syndromes that you may want to think about. Anterior cord syndrome, carotidina, transverse myelitis, all these sorts of things that can go ahead and happen in the spinal cord. We mentioned cord compression. So briefly, cord compression is when the spinal cord is actually compressed, often by bone fragments, maybe by tumor. It can happen with hematoma, especially where it's iatrogenic because they just had a procedure and it went ahead and bled into it. So you want to think about that. If a person has a history of having some sort of epidural procedure, it could have gone further, it could have an epidural hematoma. And this is regarded as a medical emergency. You don't want to be causing compression to the spinal cord, especially when it's the antigen. So you think about symptomatic management, you want to think about the back pain, how you can help. You want to think about diagnosing with x-rays, can you actually see that same thing quickly? If you want to look with a CAT scan, and of course MRI is going to be the most useful at looking at the actual parenchyma of the spinal cord. And you see other reasons that you can see compression here as well, where it really pushes on the spinal cord. So the treatment and prognosis, you want to think about steroids, you want to think about steroids early on, you want to bring down the inflammation. If you wait too long, you're going to have a problem. Often you go immediately to surgery, and sometimes we have to go to radiation as well. Once you have complete paralysis, even using the steroids, you're going to really have less of an effect and you're really going to be outside that window that you can go ahead and treat them. The median survival of patients with metastatic spinal cord compression uh, is about 12 weeks. And so this is very important because they're already going to be metastatic to other places as well and this can be very concerning to our patients. You're going to have board questions, so go back and review really cauda syndrome. So are we talking about the problem with the spinal cord, or are we talking about the cauda so the horse tail where the nerves come out? Are you going to think more about the peripheral system as opposed to the central nervous system? And here we're really talking about the nerve roots from L1 to L5, as well as S1 as to S5. There could be tumors there, there could be trauma to the cauda it could be a lot of the same reasons that you're going to see spinal cord compression. So when you're thinking about comparing them, and this always is a board question, you think about involvement of the bladder with cauda you think about the urinary retention, you try to figure out what bladder involvement, is there weakness, is it multi-segmental, are there going to be hypoesthesia, so are there going to be sensory involvement, where are they going to do? And here you just have a table on one side, the cauda on the other hand, the spinal cord. When the spinal cord is compressed, you have increased reflexes. With cardioquina, you should have decreased reflexes. You want to think about those same sorts of ideas. You want to think about marked atrophy in the cardioquina because it's more peripheral as opposed to less or so when you have spinal cord injury. I mentioned stroke before. You can have stroke in your spinal cord. You can have cord infarctions, and they can be anterior. Remember, there's the blood vessels that go anterior. There's also posterior. Often we treat these patients with antiplatelets. Often these people are mis- or underdiagnosed because a lot of people don't think about spinal cord infarcts and how that can happen. Remember, you can have infarcts to the brain, to the optic nerve, to the eyeball, you can have it to the spinal cord as well. And this is where your history and examination, how sudden was it? Was the trauma or not can really be useful. And so if you look here, if you can see from there the different MRI segments of the spinal cord, you're going to have a T2 hyperintensity, so you're going to have a brightness, a hyperintensity on T2 imaging on the MRI, just like you would see that same idea when you look at a stroke in the brain. And so this is going to be very important when you're thinking about antiplatelet treatment for these patients. Now, we've gone through all of these, and you can really see how varied they can be. But what happens if a patient has a headache? This is a problem a lot of people see, and this is what we're going to close with, because it can happen for most of these problems, maybe even from the spinal cord, but usually from the lower back pain, other sorts of pain, but from all the other ones we can see an association of headache. So where do we begin? 
So the first thing is you want to look for those red flags. And we'll go through those red flags. And then what you try to do is make the diagnosis. If it's not a red flag, we'll make the diagnosis of primary headache, migraine, tension, cluster, and other trigeminal autonomic symptoms. Versus secondary headaches, which are the more dangerous ones. A, a primary headache disorder is one you want to have. Secondary is one you don't want to have because it means that you have a tumor or bleed or some cause of the headache as well. So secondary headache, meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's less of what we see in headache. And of course, we see the primary headaches a lot more. This is how you remember the red flags that happen in migraine. To snoop for it, you want to snoop for it. So two S's, so you want to think about systemic symptoms. So is the person having fever, are they having weight loss? We start to think about cancers. Are there other secondary risk factors such as HIV or systemic disease? Well, patients who have these are ones that we want to be very careful about. Are there neurologic symptoms? Are there neurologic signs? These are going to be very important. If a person has a migraine, they don't normally have these, although there are types of headaches that are hemiplegic migraines. So having one of these doesn't mean they necessarily have a red, necessarily a problem, but it is a red flag. When is the onset? Is it sudden? Most headaches aren't that sudden. Are they in older individuals? We start thinking about whether the person has giant cell arthritis, and so these are going to be important as well. The previous headache history. Even if this is not the first headache, is this much worse than any other? Is this going to be a different type of headache? Now remember, you're always going to have the worst headache of your life. At any point, one headache has to be worse than the others, but you really have to think about whether it's thunder clap or not. And if you have signs of papal edema, that is of course concerning. And are there precipitants? Is there something you can do that increases the intracranial pressure that's going to cause the headache? And those are ones that you want to think of. On the other hand, you have comfort signs. When you have these, you feel a little more comfortable. So the person has normal neurological exam. It's menstrually related, so it's catamenial. It's typical to features that we see in other patients or in that patient. They have a family history of migraine, and they're exhibiting what looks like migraine. And if they respond to appropriate therapy, Although I saw a patient in training who had what looked like migraine, she responded fairly well to triptans, and it turned out that she was having little microbleeds because she had CNS vasculitis. So people respond to medications like triptans, they can try some triptan, you know, wall packs, rise of triptan, max all that can keep going on for seven, and there are eight of these triptans. But it's still, it's a little of a comfort sign. Headache in the emergency department, you want to look for the acute systemic illness. Is this the first or worst headache? Is there progressively worsening headaches that are happening? You start thinking about brain tumors. Or is this the last straw? And often they come because this is the last straw. They don't have other types of care. They use the emergency department as the primary care physicians. What can mimic a migraine? Subarachnoid hemorrhage, sometimes transient ischemic attack. Although usually ischemia is not causing headache really the bleeding that does that, and that's because it irritates the meninges. And remember from the movie with Hannibal, where he ate parts of the brain, that you don't have the pain receptors in the brain, you have them wrapping on the meninges itself. Glaucoma can cause headaches, meningitis. Optic neuritis can mimic the type of pain, the searing pain that we often see in the eyeball, as well as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, so pseudotumor surgery. We look at the examination, we obviously do vital signs, we do the systemic, we do neurologic. We want to make sure we look inside the fundus. We want to make sure there's not a lot of neck stiffness. With that said, 85% of people with migraines have some neck pain and neck stiffness. They have sinus symptoms 80 to 90% of the time. So you are going to see these things, but it's going to help you in terms of thinking, are there red flags or are there not? Are there abnormal signs? Are there other systemic illness? Is there papadema? These are all things you want to think about to ensure that you're not dealing with an emergency headache as opposed to just a headache that the person is having. So when you think about the cranial arteries, you're starting to think about giant cell arthritis. You're starting to think about temporal arthritis. And those are going to be dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous is not the headache. The reason it's dangerous is because it can cause strokes to the eye and can lead to blindness. We want to look at other signs like clumsiness, ataxia. Is there a difference in reflexes? Is there really a different neurologic examination?
the Minsky sign up going toe could suggest upper motor neuron involvement and perhaps a brain tumor or other mass effect that's going on. Neuroimaging, when do we use a CT, when do we use an MRI? For the normal migraine, and remember classic migraine is less common than the common migraine. Classic migraine is with aura, and common migraine is more common type than out of us. If you started MRIing everybody with a headache, what you would be doing is wasting a lot of money. And that's why what we look at, when we look at these emergency signs. Often when they come to the emergency department with a headache, they're going to have a CT already. But we think about the MRI being a lot more useful. The CT can show blood, but MRI with gradient echo sequences that are discussed can also show the bleed. Sometimes we want to look at the blood vessels, but sometimes MRI can miss things that you can see on CT angiography or even with normal angiography. Anybody know what this is an image of? What do you see here? So in this patient, you have an epidural hematoma. And then in this patient, anybody have an idea? So in this patient, you have a subdural hematoma. These are questions that are going to be on your boards. But CT can miss a lot. It can miss vascular disease. It can miss whether there's high or low intracranial pressure. It can miss tumors sometimes. And the cervical medullary lesions can be missed because it's harder to see the posterior fossa, because there's more bone artifacts. And it can miss infections as well. I mentioned papilledema. You want to make sure to do that fundoscopic examination, that direct fundoscopic examination. And you want to think about how this can lead to visual problems and eventually to blindness. Sometimes we can see bilateral papilledema as well. When you have increased intracranial pressure, when you have papilledema, you want to do an MRI or CT. You want to make sure there's not a mass lesion. You want to go ahead to lumbar puncture. Don't forget that you need to get opening pressure. The real way of getting opening pressure is do it when the patient's not sitting, when the patient is in the lateral position, and actually you extend out their legs. Often we don't do that, but we think we get a good enough pressure thing, and we don't want the needle to move. When somebody goes and gets under fluoroscopy, that can be a problem because so often they do not measure, they do not flip the person to the side and measure opening pressure. Meningitis, we've already discussed, that the white blood cells are going to be very, very high. So when do you do a lumbar puncture? When it's the first unusually severe headache, is it thunderclap? Could this be subarachnoid blood? Could this be an infection? Don't forget the opening pressure. Thunderclap headache is that severe sudden onset headache that you're going to have. And even though it doesn't have to be, you have to rule out that it wasn't a neurologic effect. But often it's just primary migraine. It could be subarachnoid hemorrhage. These are going to be sudden and dramatic, as we talked about. And you may have backache as well with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is where migraine ties into the idea of spinal cord. When you do a CT or MRI early on, you can actually miss the subarachnoid blood, a lumbar puncture after 12 hours should really have a probability of 100% of catching the idea of the blood. So xanthochromia, where the blood in the spinal fluid doesn't get brighter, doesn't necessarily get brighter, which may be active bleeding, maybe from putting the needle in, but when there's actually the effect where you're seeing the uh, yellow tinge of the blood because it's happening because of breakdown products in it as well. And the further you get away, the less likely you're going to see it. When we think about thunderclap headaches, we think about vascular and non-vascular. Subarachnoid is the thing we're the most scared of. Non-vascular, there could be a colloid cyst. You want to make sure you don't have this. You want to make sure that you don't have spontaneous intracranial hypotension as well, where the person either spontaneously has a loss of the spinal fluid. You want to make sure that there's not a spinal fluid leak. Or they could have had it because of something we did, such as a lumbar puncture, or because of a car accident, actually, you could have it. And I published on treating that not with a lumbar epidural blood patch, but even doing cervical in people who didn't spot, which is very risky. And you're kind of scared of going into that area. But sometimes we do go ahead with interventionalists and think that the blood patch over there can shore up the leakage and go from Cerebral vascular causes of, uh, of the thunderclap headache. We talked about all these. You could have malformations, you could have AVNs, you could have dissections. Other disorders, I mentioned tumors. These are just to give you some pictures of all of them. 
In summary, for thunderclap headache, we have to know the differential. We have to make sure it's not something emergent, but often it can just be primary migraine. This acute headache, 47 year old man with episodes of severe orbital frontal and temporal pain, like a hot poker through his eye, accompanied by droopy eyes, feels restless, pain worse than death. So you can hear, see here how he has the ptosis going on. And what you see here is a trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. Affects the trigeminal, autonomic. You can go ahead and see problems with sweating. You can see cranial autonomic activation on one side. And cephalgia just means head pain that you're going to see. Migraine features are not that are not that uncommon in these patients. This is a table that you're going to have to look at for your board examinations, cluster, then you have paroxysmal hemicrania, you have SUNA, and you have SUNT. So SUNT is short lateral, short uh, unilateral, nasal congestion, conjunctival injection, and tearing that you're going to see with these patients. And really the way you make the differential of these different trigeminal autonomic cephalgia is how fast they happen, how many times they happen during the day, because otherwise they're fairly similar. This patient, though, may have not been typical. He had a thunderclap onset, he had prominent neck pain. You think about patients that are tall, thin, and flexible, you want to think about Marfan syndrome. And the reason you want to think about all this is because carotid dissection could be a cause of these. Spontaneous inter internal carotid artery dissection is uncommon but is a medical emergency. You may have a brewery, you may have Horner syndrome, you may have focal cerebral symptoms well, because the dissection can lead to a stroke or to TIAs. Common sites of the pain are going to be the neck, but also going to be a lot of them around the eye and the front of the face, and you don't want to mistake this for a sinus headache either. Other secondary causes, glaucoma can cause trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. You want to think about the intracavernous carotid artery thrombosis, which may cause also this autonomic cephalgia. I want to remind you and I want to thank you guys so much for your attention. We covered all of neurologic emergencies, although that's just the tip of the iceberg. It really can extend beyond there to the different things that we think about. And to give you an idea of when you need a neurologist, when you're having these sorts of issues come up, hopefully you can get your neurologist quickly. If you can't, I am the president of the Florida Society of Neurology. Let me know if you have any problems in your area. I invite all of you to our annual meeting. September 28th to 30th. We have multiple tracks, neurology through the ages. What happens nowadays with people who start with Pompe's disease and now we're seeing that in adulthood, for example. So often adult neurologists and pediatric and pediatric neurologists or adults, anything in pediatrics don't talk to each other. What happens to transitional age? We're going to go through that. We're going to explore different disease states based on different ages of presentation and how to treat them. We have neurology for the non-neurologists. We're being very practical. I'm going to be teaching a course, part of a course called Numbness, Tingling, and Blurry Vision. We're trying to be really practical. One of them is called, you know, I'm having problems thinking, and it's going through dementia and other mental status problems. Then we also have, starting on that Friday, on the 28th, we have the neuropsychology and behavioral neurology, the disconnection syndrome, and some ideas, all these syndromes that cause this disconnection. We really welcome you. We have a pretty good rate, $129 a night at the Rosen Shingle Creek. I invite all of you to come. FAPA does have a free booth there at the meeting, so come and join the other FAPA leadership and register for our meeting. There is discounts for physician assistance. I want to thank you guys so much for your time.